Well, thank you guys all for joining our last Communicating Your Science webinar for the academic year. Uh, this one <clears throat> called Meet the Reporter is something that we do annually, giving our, our researchers, both the students and faculty members, a chance to meet with real live working <laughs> science and health journalists uh, and practice communicating their science and, and learning um, the skills for talking with reporters, but also the general public in a way that makes their science accessible. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm Sean Ria. I am Director of Science Media uh, and Community Outreach at the CUNY Graduate Center. So our research, I mean, our, our reporters today are Brett Dahlberg, who's an editor at Michigan Radio. He was previously a reporter at NPR member stations, WCMU in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and WXXI in Rochester, New York. He's also filed stories for National Public Radio, uh, IEE Spectrum, The Village Voice, and other outlets. We have H. Conley, who is a former cheesemaker turned journalist, an audio engineer who reports on food, climate, and trans health and identity. Their work has been published in Bon Appetit, Edible, Manhattan, City Limits, Meat, and Three, and the Embodied Podcast. Uh, we have Teresa Gaffney, who's a reporter and podcast producer at STAT, uh, where she writes and mainly covers mental health, gender affirming care, and reproductive health. And she also leads production of all stats podcasts. We have uh, Zoe Gruskin, who is a science journalist in Brooklyn. She got her start as a radio reporter in Alaska, where she covered everything from climate change to dog sleds. And uh, she is currently an editorial fellow at Audubon Magazine, where she writes about biodiversity, ecology, zoonotic diseases, earth science, and other areas of science. We have Lucy Rong, who is um, an associate producer at Spoke Media. Lucy also produced and reported for Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, Science Friday, Scientific American, and Texas Public Radio. And finally, we have Aaron Temper, who is a science journalist producer based in DC. His work has appeared in Science News, Science News Explorers, Audubon Magazine, uh, and uh, Atlanta NPR member station WABE. Uh, next slide. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and she's gonna talk a little bit about what reporters need. Thank you, Sean. It's so exciting to see my alums, like how many wonderful things you're all doing. It's really awesome. Um, so yes, I need to update my profile picture. Obviously it's quite old. Uh, so, but I just, I'm really excited to be here and to have this opportunity for me and my alumni uh, reporters and journalists to chat with scientists in a casual way, um, maybe even build some friendships and ongoing collaborations. And I do really wanna thank uh, Sean Ria for her vision to bring together scientists and journalists um, and just her inspired ideas about how to do this productively and also Josephine Peterson for um, being a huge part of the team as well. So um, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, scientists in general, I think, do want to get more attention for their work. And at the same time, journalists are always looking for a cool new science, you know, to, to cover. So on that level, we have, you know, really shared interests. But I think it's really helpful to understand the different frameworks that we each work within. So there's a lot of things, you know, that science journalists and scientists have in common, like curiosity, um, a quest for knowledge, but there are some differences as well. So I'm going to just briefly try and, you know, share with the scientists some things that, you know, maybe be helpful to understand about how journalists think and how we work um, that might make it easier sort of to create these connections. Um, so the why now, um, you know, journalism, you know, science is very incremental, right? And you're always kind of looking to the next study. It's not like, oh, we, you know, we we found this and closed the book. It's always, you know, this constant quest, but journalism is very different. It's like, we want something that just happened now and we want to make a big deal out of it, right? So um, I think that, you know, Every journalist who contacts you needs a news hook. That's something for you to know. Their, their editor is going to be like, why should we be publishing this now? So it's extremely helpful if you are able to 
connect to something that in your work that, you know, you just published something or, you know, something else that's going on. The other thing that journalists always want to know is why it matters. So, you know, typically scientists may often be hyper-focused on, you know, the very specific thing they're studying, but it's really helpful. And this is something you can kind of train your brain to do if you're not already doing it, to be always kind of contemplating, like, why would this matter to the general public? Like, why would regular people be interested, even if it's not directly like exactly the experiment that you're doing right now, but just the bigger questions that your field is is trying to answer that must, you know, be relevant in certain ways. So those are just two things to keep in mind. Um, so another thing to know is, um, oh, one more thing I wanted to say about that. So it's great if they're potential applications to your work because you know we love to connect things to the real world. But sometimes it's just, oh, this might change how scientists are understanding something. Like that's pretty interesting as well. Um, one thing that's really nice is if you're willing to speculate, I know not everyone's comfortable with that, but scientists who are willing to go a little bit beyond the frame and, and think about, well, what could this lead to or what might this mean? That's always very helpful for a journalist. Um, so another thing when I mentioned about basic questions. So you have to realize that, you know, sometimes you will be talking to a reporter who hasn't done their research and that I'm sure is annoying, but other times they're gonna ask you really basic questions, not because they don't know the answers, but because they need to hear it in your words. A lot of times scientists are like, why are you asking me that? You know, didn't you read my paper? So um, just be aware they're, that they're speaking on part of their audience. And so they're asking questions for their story, not necessarily because they don't know the answer. So that's maybe helpful. Um, the other thing, um, and I think Sean's going to touch on this too, is trying to speak in a, an accessible language, you know, in a way that is non-technical because if you don't, they won't really be able to quote you, you know, they'll probably paraphrase what you say, but you know, you, the, the, if you can speak and explain stuff in a way that like is, is engaging and easy for a regular person to understand, that's a big plus. Um, and it's always great to have a metaphor in your pocket. I, I'm just going to mention one that um, uh, psychologist Mark Beeman of Northwestern University, I interviewed him not too long ago, and we were talking about the aha moment, you know, that moment of, of recognition that happens in the brain. And he said, trying to find a creative solution to a problem is like trying to see a dim star at night. You have to kind of look at it out of the corner of your mind. And I really love that. Um, so these are the kinds of things to kind of bounce around in your own minds as you're going about your work. You know, are there any cool metaphors that you could think of? Because journalists love those. Um, another thing to be aware of is, you know, journalists are interested in your experience, you know, not just what you found, but why you went about the work, what was frustrating, what, you know, they're looking for those little stories um, and they want to capture some of your personality. So I know often scientists aren't that comfortable with that because it's very different from how you work as a scientist. So just to be aware of that. And they may ask you questions about that. But again, if you're talking to a journalist about your work and there's a funny story associated with it, either how you got into it or some kind of mishap that happened along the way or whatever it is, like definitely share that with them, even if they don't ask or ask if they would like to hear about it, because I think those are the kinds of things that, you know, make it easier for us to share science with the public. And then a few just like tips that I wanted to add. And so this sounds really superficial, but um, writing grabby study titles um, and, and also, well, so I'll start with the titles. That's really helpful because often we'll be scanning through like so many study titles looking for something that, that catches our eye. And if the title is super, super technical, it's less likely that we're going to think it's going to be something that would be interesting to our audience. Same with the abstract. Like in the abstract, if you could just insert a couple of sentences that kind of uh, suggest how this work might um, be interesting to the public, how it might relate to like real life or people's lives. That is also the kind of thing that might catch a journalist's eye and they're gonna think, hmm, okay. Um, another just quick thing is to reach out before the study is published. A lot of times scientists will reach out to a journalist and say, hey, I just had a study come out this week. You know, do you wanna cover it? And for us, sometimes it's still possible, but it's ideal if you let us know once it's been accepted by a journal, but before it comes out. So we have enough time to prepare our story. So, cause editors like it when they're not scooped. So it's ideally our story would appear exactly on the same day that your study gets published. So that's just something to know and, and, and just have in mind. Also, it says beef up your online faculty page. So a lot of times we're looking for experts. Um, we might go to 
the faculty page and it's sometimes people are really specific and it's super helpful if you say here are the questions i'm interested in here are the kinds of projects i work on et cetera, et cetera, so that you can kind of see some people are very just schematic and they don't really say and it's just like i'm a psychologist or whatever so the more you can kind of like be chatty there and be uh, communicative on your faculty page that's great and then of course there are the expert databases that you can register with especially if you're a woman scientist a scientist of color um, there's a lot of um, places that you can register that people journalists will go to to look for you so that's good too and um, Josephine if you could mix, move to the next slide I just wanted to share this thing with you because I thought it was so apropos when I saw it recently so Jennifer Dudna, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but you know, she was one of the inventors of CRISPR. And, on, and there was this article that Carl Zimmer did on the 10th anniversary of CRISPR. And she, it says, looking back, Dr. Dudna wondered if, uh, basically if, if uh, okay, 10 years ago this week, Jennifer Dudna and her colleagues published the results of a test tube experiment on bacterial genes. When the study came out in 2012, it did not make headline news. In fact, over the next few weeks, it did not make any news at all. Looking back, Dr. Duna wondered if the oversight had something to do with the wonky title she and her colleagues had chosen for the study, a programmable dual RNA guided DNA endonucleates and adaptive bacterial immunity. Um, so I just thought that she said, I suppose I would have written, chosen a different title. So I just thought that was a really great example because what has been more like earth shattering in our world practically over the last 10 years in science, but CRISPR, but basically journalists missed it. Um, and so again, that's not the only reason, but I do think it's very helpful to have a more um, engaging title for your papers. So I'm gonna leave it at that, but I'm looking forward to this collaborative experience. Thank you, Emily. Um, just to, before um, I go into um, some tips for how you can better communicate your science or, or effectively communicate your science, I just wanted to piggyback on something Emily mentioned. I, I'm pretty sure most of the folks on here are students and not faculty. So one of the things in terms of, she mentioned beefing up the faculty page. One of the things that you guys can do as students, um, if you're working in labs, is to encourage your, um, your, 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 your um, advisor to beef up the page, you know, particularly maybe hi better highlight the roles of the student researchers in the work that's being done, right? I know oftentimes students get charged with actually helping to um, update that information on the page. So those Can are- Can I add? Mm -hmm. Oh, just to back, yeah. To, to, yeah, to amplify that, Sean, because that's a great comment. And I just want to let you know that uh, journalists are very interested, especially, you know, journalists who are starting out and speaking with PhD students and with postdocs and stuff like that. So it's not like we only want to talk to like the most, you know, like whatever experienced scientists. It can be so helpful to connect with people who are earlier in their career. So don't feel discouraged on that level. Yeah. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about how you can develop some skills to be able to, um, talk about science in the way that Emily has so um, nicely outlined. So one of the first important things has to do with language, which I, I know Emily touched on, but you know, it's really important to use layman's language. And this isn't just in talking with reporters, but this is also you know, at the dinner table, even I have attended a number of science talks and I find that even scientists are much more interested when the person doing the presentation is presenting in a way that's very accessible. Um, and so, for an example of how you might use layman's language, you know, if you're in biology, the average person doesn't know what a pluripotent cell is, right? So instead you might say something like it's a self-renewing cell that produces almost any type of cell or tissue that the body might need. That's something that everyone pretty much can understand. If you're in physics, for example, the average person does not know what photovoltaics are, and I can never pronounce the word properly anyway, but they do know what solar is, right? And so you can you can you can replace words like that um, in order to make concepts more acceptable, uh, more accessible. And then you can also use short, concise sentences that will help your audience better absorb new concepts. If you cram, cram a bunch of unfamiliar words and new concepts into one or two sentences, people are just going to be overwhelmed and they're going to completely tune out. So sometimes you have to break the information down and easily discernible chunks of information. Um, 
So also, it's also important to communicate the new information first when you're talking to lay audiences. You only have a few seconds to capture their attention, so you don't want to bury the lead. And so think about communi communicating your information in this order. So what is your new discovery, finding, or recommendation? Why does it matter? You know, who does it help? And we talked a little bit about that, right? So for example, um, one of the scientists that I work with over at the ASRC does a lot of research around, um, uh, what is it, a fluorescent fish. So that can just sound like, oh, it's interesting to know what makes a fish glow. But it actually, that, that signaling process within the fish has applications in medical development, in, in, medicine, um, in pharmaceutical development. So connecting what seem to be very, you know, esoteric areas of research to what is really practical and useful. So that's what you're looking for and, you know, why it matters. So, uh, and then, you know, develop three kind of solid points that really further explain your research. The next thing that's super, super important is to know your audience. You're going to talk about your research differently um, based on the audience. So a why, your why it matters message is going to vary, whether you're talking to funders or your peers or the general public or whether you're talking to industry. So knowing your audience is very important. And so this last little um, graphic here, which comes from AAAS, it's, it's really nice um, kind of way to explain the difference between how researchers think uh, and talk about their work compared to how the public actually absorbs information. So as a researcher, often if you're reading a paper, you start with the background, you give you know, a whole history of all of the research that really has created the step ladder for where you are right now. You give supporting details about how you did the experiment. And then at the end, you have a conversation about the results of the conclusions, right? It's very different. The general public actually wants to know what those results and conclusions are. Okay, what is it that you're talking to me about? And so what, why is it important? And then finally, those supporting details that help underline all the information and support the facts behind what you're sharing. So um, next slide. So um, uh, Josephine is gonna set us up with this, this video. Um, I love this series that Wired used to do called Five Levels because it literally has one researcher. I see some people shaking their heads, so some folks are familiar with it, I think. Um, how they explain their research to people, uh, to five different people who have various levels of understanding about research. Uh, everyone from, a, I think, a third grader is the youngest, all the way up to a peer in the field. Um, and uh, we're going to watch this for about 10 minutes. Hi, my name is Talia Gershon, and I'm a scientist at IBM Research. Yes. Today, I've been challenged to explain a topic with five levels of increasing complexity. It's a completely different kind of computing called quantum computing. Quantum computers approach solving problems in a fundamentally new way. So um, I guess we just have a few more minutes. We have about, about five minutes. Um, so before we, um, before we wrap up, I just want to find out if anyone has any questions or wants to share any, any interesting conversation or learning um yeah well oh, sure. i can I, make oh, a okay. comment no, no okay i'll i'll go for if you don't mind i'll go first if that's fine um so yeah thank you again for this experience and it was really helpful to think about like for myself getting into the details of the discussion of what i'm working on but to continuously bring that back to a more general sense of what my product is supposed to be or what my theory and my thesis is really supposed to be about that for me is going to be a product too and to make sure I continue to have that through way of why as you said the research is important and to not only perpetuate it as okay this is what I'm doing this is why I think it's important this is why what's what I'm making it's about what I'm giving <laughs> which I got points back from both of the um, reporters I spoke to that that was something that is really focused on too, from it sounds like from a reporter perspective, that that's really what they would like to hear. And that can be helpful as the point of what people want. So that was good. That was really good for me. And then who, who else was it? Uh, uh, Rendra, was it you that was going yes, to Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's wonderful talking to you and Conley and the Brett. I got really good feedback from them, what I should speak to the reporter in future. And I'm a, thank you. Great. I think Aaron also wanted to say something. 
Yeah, I was just going to add um, for one of the segments that I write, um, you know, I look for early STEM professionals, um, which means I'm coming through videos and Twitter for a presence online. So I just highly recommend, especially if you're a younger audience, if you're looking to get your work out there, kind of making yourself visible online in some way that's comfortable for you. Because there have been some people that have done awesome work that I've had to pass because I couldn't tell if they were a great speaker or if they I could actually contact them because they just didn't have any of that online. So if you're really looking to make yourself visible and reachable, I'd highly recommend that. So Aaron, are there any particular platforms that you really tend to uh, peruse for STEM presence? You know, for yeah. Yeah, despite the climate of it right now, I am on Twitter um, because it does have such, you know, it has built such a uh, large audience and I'm finding a lot of folks aren't, some are leaving, some are not, you know, it's controversial, but I am on Twitter but I'm on Twitter to find their links. So I also look at YouTube if they've done, doesn't have to be a TED talk, but if they've done a TED talk, um, I could really see how they speak with an audience. Um, I think I was talking in my first interview about just like lab pages. If they have a lab page and they're showing video of what they're doing, that's gonna pique my interest, especially if they're also talking on it and demonstrating or explaining their work. I'm going to hone in on that for sure. Instead of just a study with no visuals, right? or Instagram, social media, any kind of, yeah, others, platforms like that. Yeah, and that brings up a really important point. So often when I'm working with researchers, um, for they've got great papers that they want a press release done for. And um, then we start to struggle about how do we represent it visually. So it's always good throughout your research. If interesting things come up in the lab, take a photo, take a video, put it aside. You never know when it might come in handy, right? Okay, Emily, do you have anything else you wanna share maybe or no? I mean, I just, I think the magic happened in the rooms with the people, you know, talking to one another. Um, I know, I mean, I just got to speak with only one scientist really, which is Austin. And um, I don't know if you connected with both Zoe and Aaron, but I want you to meet both of them. So if there's one that you didn't meet, like let's connect and I'll connect you because he's got this great bird oriented project that he's doing that I think could be of interest to either of both of you. And same for you. Thank you for that, Emily. Thank you. Yeah. And, and same for you, Katie, because I know that you're working with birds as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, I don't know a little bit. I don't know a lot about every, what everyone's doing, but yes, I mean, I just love this idea that we're connecting more and I hope that some of these relationships will continue. And I think for us as journalists, it's so great to have a scientist that you can just call up, you feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. and you can say, hey, can you connect me? Or can you look this over? Um, and I would think it would be the same for scientists, right? To just feel like you can like connect with a journalist and like, you know, share what your work is and, you know, just bad ideas around. So um, I just love that we're doing this and continuing to do it. Okay, well, we're gonna end right on time then. Um, thank you all. And um, I hope everyone gained a little bit of something uh, from, uh, oh, Zoe said she got to talk to both. Uh, okay, That's great. Awesome. Okay, great. You guys have a wonderful weekend. Before you Thanks, jump everyone. On. Thanks for your time. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on one second. Sorry, right, sorry. Just keep an eye out for an email from me with um, just a very short evaluation about the program today. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thanks, oh, everybody. Great to see you. Bye. Bye.